Welcome, everyone. I'm Angela Robles. I'm the founder and CEO at Family Office Association. Today, my topic in this solo video is going to be, what is a single family office? Some people would define it as, what is a family office? Now, I know I've done, in shorter form, these videos before. I probably badly, which is why I'm redoing it, and hopefully, debatable, going to do a better job at it now. So let's try it again. And this is applicable, of course, if you're a novice and don't really know, that probably is what it's mainly for. It's one of the most common cocktail party questions that I would get when they hear my company name or hear a little bit about me, like, what is a family office? And what's this single family office? Why? What does it do? Uh, so in most traditional sense, it's a company created by one family of great wealth and success to internally and exclusively to them manage their financial and often help to manage their other affairs. To some degree, it acts as a buffer between them and the outside world because lots of people are reaching out and lots of people are pulling on them. So let's take a little bit of a step back and break that down. What kind of people, families, individuals, whatever, would create a single family office? Well, they're going to be wealthy, they're going to be successful, but that's defined differently and that standard has changed even to having a single family office over the years, mainly thanks to better outsourcing and technology, all things that we're going to get into. But generally in answering that question, it would be an entrepreneur that had a successful exit, a C-level high-ranking executive that has done well in the corporate world, we could say, or perhaps an inheritor where the family didn't have a family office prior, but they look at they look at it as beneficial to unifying the family and getting better at the services that they want. What are the advantages? So again, they're creating a company just like any other, an LLC, a C Corp, technically for profit. We'll get a little bit as, as to why shortly. And they're bringing in talent. And it, it may be the family being involved as well, but usually at least one person from outside the family. So the talent's going to be exclusive 24-7 to them. What are the advantages? Privacy, control, and customization. They get what they want, how they want it, 24-7. Uh, why? Because they can. They have had the successes financially to be able to do so. And you have to realize there's a bit of a target on their back. Everyone is coming for them, mainly to get their money. <laughs> for services, products, whatever it may be. And being able to kind of pass that on or have the buffer of your own entity and maybe a little bit of pride and ego with that, this single family office. Let's take a little bit of a step back. How long have family offices been in, uh, around? Well, probably the most classic definition is a couple of hundred years ago in Europe. Uh, here in America, the Rockefeller family in the late 1800s. But I could really argue, going back to Asia, <laughs> thousands of years ago, families that had wealth and success effectively had entities and people dedicated to them to help manage their wealth, their interest, their business interest, etc. So it really goes back a long way. The other question that you should be asking is why? Okay, you mentioned privacy control and customization, but why don't, if I'm wealthy, I don't go to a bank or banks? Why don't I go to a private bank? Or why don't I go to a multifamily office or a financial advisor or an accountant or attorney? And all those pieces are going to be needed. Some of it you may have internal at your family office, but often they'll need to deal with quote-unquote people like that. But in answering that question, because when you have your own company and it's dedicated 24-7 just to you, that is something that is exclusive 
just for you. You go to a financial advisor, an accountant or attorney, who are all needed, but you're not their only client. Their interest is to build a successful and profitable company. They want to meet other rich people and take them in as clients. A bank. Every family of great wealth needs banks, and banks do great things. Lending, opportunities for deals and access, uh, cash management. I could go on and on. Many families of great wealth have multiple banking relationships. But would I just want to simply not have a family office and work with one or two banks and give them all my capital? Well, it's what I just said. They're not 24-7 dedicated to you. No matter how big you are as a family, they're likely much bigger than you. And look at the structure. Let's, let's pick on a public entity. So they're owned by shareholders, the board of directors, needs to provide value to the shareholders, revenue. The board of directors has a CEO below them, a C-level executives, and then there's various managers and people and teams within the bank. They are there to make money, which is okay. They're a for-profit company. They want to take on lots of families that are really, really rich. How are they going to have only a fiduciary responsibility dedicated only to you? That's no, that's not going to happen. So especially if you're an entrepreneur that you work so hard to create a company and develop wealth and success and investing prudently, whatever it may be, you want to hold on to that. You want to pass on your wealth and legacy. You want to mitigate taxes. You want to hedge risk that could happen. Uh, all things that we're going to get to in terms of what a single family office does, which is different than what is a single family office. So then this also begs the question again, how come there's not more knowledge about single family offices? Well, one, there's a finite number of them. <laughs> you know, not everyone is really, really rich or has the interest in creating one or has one existing. So there's a limited number, there's limited research, they're private, they're off the grid. Uh, there's not much context that is even out there broadly in the internet, which you think would cover everything, but is going to be a little bit more limited than the family office world. Uh, two, there's relatively few people that really know it, live it and love it, are obsessed by it inside and out and know the nuances of it. And three, and this is a big one and a little bit of an uncomfortable subject, by the way, and that is people that are close to you, you're a wealthy family member, and you have advisors, and they're probably good, but you have advisors that may know just enough about a family office and feel, oh, if this person creates their own family office, is my relationship with them going to change? And I got to be buffered now between my relationship with them and the family office. So self-conflict, uh, that's an issue for even people that have some knowledge that would maybe an agent, a manager, an attorney, a banker, uh, that are good at what they do, but are concerned that you creating this entity may not be good for them. And you have to look at it from their side and shocking as my next comment is, understand that a little bit. We're all concerned about our own self-interest, which is really the reason why you're creating a single family office in the first place. So getting the right knowledge and making the decision to say, what are my options? I want to be more familiar with the concept called a single family office how could I learn more? Who could I talk to? And how could I make a proper decision? Assuming you make a decision to start one, and I'm assuming you're getting guidance from someone who has a significant level of experience in the whole process, uh, not too unlike really any company. And again, it is technically a company, an LLC, an S Corp, a C Corp. I'm not going to get into the nuances really, really deep on structuring and creating an SFO. That's a subject for a different video and other interviews that I do in one of the most common subjects that we cover. But in general, it is going to have 
again, the proper entity structure that, again, you're using, I'm assuming, an attorney, one that knows a thing or two about single-family offices and the proper creation, creation, structuring, and proper domicile. But I don't want to get too deep on that. Uh, you are going to need, effectively, a business plan, uh, an idea of how you're going to structure, which is what I just said, and a sense of organization in the people. Uh, is it going to be you internally? Uh, how are you going to structure a boarding committees? Again, not too different. And those of you that have created companies and have been successful, this sounds like something you're probably relatively pretty familiar with. You understand that. In my opinion, the most important things determining a successful single family office are people. So the talent, ideas, effectively creativity and the ability to speak your mind and Lately, I'm going to throw in technology. Some people would broadly say machines. And of course, this all has to be led with proper leadership and culture and executed upon the goals that that family has. Really understand, why does the family want to create a family office? How important is it for them to have privacy control and customization? That's usually the big one with a lot of them. Customization. And for what I said earlier, 24-7, completely dedicated to you. There's no entity that you could outsource to that could say that because they want to pick up other clients. Their self-interest is going to be first and foremost. In my opinion, one of the main reasons for creating a family office is to mitigate risk, to hedge against problems, for your family office to have the right talent and resources to nip problems in the bud before they happen to be proactive, to look forward, uh, to manage black swan risk. And hello, as I'm doing this video, it's during COVID-19. And look how much things changed really just in the last two months. It's mid-May at the moment that I'm doing this. So you want to understand what do I own? How do I own it? How liquid am I? And what options do I have to mitigate and hedge against risk? In public equities, that's relatively easy. Also, having liquidity helps. It's a little more complicated when you have a holdings like real estate and private interests. But even then, there are strategies you could take to mitigate risk. That may mean that you're taking some profit off the table. But would you rather make 1% or 2% less a year to potentially hedge against something that could be a 30 or 40% downturn? You don't want something to happen. That in one day, this may be rare, but in one day, could topple everything that you or your family built often over decades. And henceforth, a single family office that is proper, that has the right people, is going to be able to be a moat around you. You are in your castle. You need to have a strength in your foundation, and a moat around you to protect you. And that's not to be a miser and to hoard your money, unless that's what you want. It really is so you can have what you've built and the taxes that you've paid and contributed to society that you can make the right decisions for you and your family of what you want to have happen. It absolutely, philanthropy should be a part of that and often is for many families, whether during living or upon death. But the opportunity to pass on, and these are all the important topics of a family office, your, your, not just your financial wealth, but your legacy, your entrepreneurial spirit and background, what you've learned, the contacts that you made, these are all gonna be incredibly important. So although the topic is what is a single family office, what does a single family office do is important to understand in the context of what I'm talking about. So we already discussed the importance of mitigating really horrific risk uh, from cyber attack to, you know, what if a tsunami happens? What if you no longer can access the workplace? What if a principal goes down? What if the head of your family office goes down? These are all things that a proper family office has a process to an outcome, has policy and procedures, and has a game plan around. Now, yeah, we all know, like the great philosopher Mike Tyson said, we all have a plan until we get hit. And wow, 
Is that a great comment, by the way? <laughs> During the midst of it, what it appears like he's making a comeback. And given that we're just about the same age and from the New York area, I wish him all the best. But that is oh so true. So this goes even back to the philosophies of Seneca. Many of you follow philosophy, and he's become very, mainly thanks to Ryan Holiday and others, very popular lately. And really, it's understanding risk putting yourself through trials and tribulations and imagining what these risks and challenges are so you could better not only toughen yourself up, but uh, have a chance to look at ways that you could look at challenges and problems. And again, this is all going to be the benefit of the SFO, stress testing yourself, your family, playing out what if scenarios, what if this happens, challenging assumptions. Sometimes, when you're working with outside providers that you're paying a lot of money to, they're a little afraid to rock your boat because they're concerned that you may pull out the money and resources from them. Now, I'm not saying family offices are perfect, single family offices, although if you're not going to have a great single family office, really why have one at all? But in theory, you want them to be, again, what's really important, people, ideas, and technology is third, important but third. You want them to challenge assumptions. You want them to keep an eye for mitigating and hedging risk. Uh, you, you, you want to watch out for confirmation bias, for group thinking, anchoring. You don't want someone to kiss up to the family. You want someone to be incredibly talented as a true leader, a developer of culture, and servicing a heart of service upon the goals of the family but understanding that, yeah, things could very much go wrong. And if you strongly disagree with something, it's the opportunity for you to bring that up and to have an open dialogue. And absolutely, the family should respect that and be a part of that. Uh, you know, this all goes to the whole thing, and I'm really big on mitigating and managing risk, uh, to the whole thing of kind of what uh, Red Army and Red Cell versus here's our game plan. And this goes back hundreds of years ago, uh, pr probably in Germany, relative to their, their army in terms of the generals choosing a game plan. But before they actually take that into the battlefield, how about having an opposing point of view look to punch holes in it, make it an intellectual discussion, an opportunity. But if you have groupthink, if you look for only people that agree with your opinion on confirmation bias, that's never going to happen. So a really, really good single family office could question and challenge certain ideas and directions of the family. But that single family office should also do the same for what they're looking to do upon servicing and executing upon the goals and the decisions for the family. We all have blind spots and having a second set of eyes and people that could give us honest and critical feedback is really, really important. Again, how could you be 24-7 dedicated really to you and your family? Which is, if you're going to have a single family office, then do it great. And nothing is going to be able to match it. Nothing. Am I biased in my perspective as founder and CEO at Family Office Association? I suppose I am. Now, let's get into the old topic of you need hundreds of millions of dollars plus to have a single family office, an entity that you create with talent that is dedicated and, work, and working inside that company around the goals and the mission, the mission and the goals that you have as a family. That would be nice. Billions would be even better. And if you're going to be an active direct investor investing in private companies, and building out teams of PE professionals that are going to cost you a lot of money, then yeah, probably having above half a billion, a billion dollars or more is probably going to be more the direction to go. But is it possible to have a single family office in today's world for a far lesser amount? And we're all going to define what that amount would be differently. In theory, someone from five to 10 million is like, hey, I've done well. I have assets and resources. I want to manage them. Now, does it make sense to bring in outside people 24-7 and pay them a lot of money? It may, may hard to make the, it may be hard to make that math work. But could I make the point or the argument, especially a more virtual single-family office at tens of millions, for sure. Uh, so 
Some of it just simply comes down to a math game. Now, I know what some of you are saying, and you're probably saying, well, you know, creating this company and having internal talent and resources and dedicating time and energy, not only does it take time and energy, it also costs a lot of money. Well, that's relative. I didn't know that banks and financial advisors were free. Oh, that's news to me. So you're already paying money. You're getting services that you're probably getting overbilled for because you don't have a professional in your single family office that understands the nuances of that business and could look out on your behalf how they're engaging with such outside services and people and maybe go for a request for a proposal to price something out, especially if it is more of a commodity type service. You're already paying a lot of money when you're investing in a fund at two and 20, when you're investing or when you're putting assets and resources at banks, again, none of this is free. So your family office, what do you want to be great at and what can it do internally? Now, yeah, there are things that are going to be outsourced, of course, but for all the reasons that I just said, they may know more about the world of business and finance from the perspective than you. They're not going to have an emotional attachment or shouldn't the way that you may have to an old family friend that's a banker, etc., etc., etc. And they could look out on your behalf for the best pricing and the best service and execution relative to what those outsourced services are. Uh, so again, I always chuckle, it's expensive. Well, is protecting your wealth and heritage of tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions, or tens of billions, is that not important to you? And again, are you getting services now for free? No, the companies you're dealing with are charging you for that. So what makes it also a notch more attractive for those, say, below 100 million, and this is going to be a little bit more US-centric, but probably variations of it apply in other parts of the world, it relates to a IRS case that brought a family office to court just a couple of years ago and lost the family one. It's known as lender versus the IRS, which was basically more of an outsourced uh, family office or AKA a virtual family office to begin with uh, in terms of uh, picking a multifamily office that often did the work of choosing the investments in their portfolio. But the gist of it was, it was a for-profit entity so the company created, the management company, that is the single family office, was technically a for-profit entity, whether LLC, S-Corp, or C-Corp. Uh, and it had agreements with the trustee of the, uh, the ownership of the assets. So you have the management company family office here. You have the assets of the family here owned in various entities, had a structure and had a domicile see the attorney that knows a lot about that because this is very important and the family office had agreements with the assets it was performing a service henceforth it's able to get deductions that an individual as a private investor would not be able to get does that mean that's going to apply to you no maybe you'll lose but it creates a roadmap potentially to properly structure a single family office, not just for privacy and asset protection, but that's really important, but to potentially get tax benefits you would not get as a private individual. Now, I would be careful. Don't let the tax tail wag the dog. There's way more important reasons to have a single family office, privacy, control, customization, doing what you want to do and having, again, that moat around your castle. But if you're able to get some additional tax benefits, possibly from structuring and intertwining it correctly, and please, there's not a huge amount of attorneys and accountants that really, really know the single family office community inside and out, which is why you're going to want to have a guiding hand to help you along in this process. Uh, I did mention outsourcing a couple of times. Something that I've been very active writing about is what's called a virtual family office, which is still structured. As I said, it still is an entity and structure, technically for profit. The 
family office here, the assets and resources here, and the intertwining agreements because you want to button things down from a privacy and asset protection and possibly from, as I noted, an income tax perspective. It would likely still involve at least one person who's a non-family member, and there's a variety of reasons for that that we don't have enough detail and time to get into at the moment. But basically, it leverages more outsourcing. So what's really going to be important to the family? What potentially could we do internally as a family office? But even the biggest family offices, they use outside banks, managers, accountants, attorneys, cybersecurity professionals. So managing that process, how do you choose the best of the best? Uh, how do you get the best pricing out of them? How do you hold them to a high standard of service and execution? And that's where the family office and the person or the people inside the family office could be of tremendous, tremendous value to you. That again, for all the reasons that I noted and all the conflicts of interest that I noted, that you want to take that off the table, off the table, those problems and challenges, which are all the benefits of a family office. Now, virtual would imply, and in today's COVID world, how more important than ever, that a portion of this is remote. Well, by remote, that could be great because you could have talent that could be dispersed around the world that might even be more cost effective, but that's a sidebar. But you open up a breadth of talent and resources. Now, technologies allow for better communication, project management, uh, opportunity for aggregation and reporting of financial assets. Uh, through the cloud. Now that has some risk as well, but in today's world as we're learning when people may be separated, you want to have the opportunity, where are our assets, our resources, what's our CRM, who's our contact at each, and if something were to happen where a principal, a family member goes down, how engaged is the family office with the next person in line, the next generation, connected with the outside advisors? And what happens if a family office executive goes down? You want to have preferably polymath type skills inside the family office where people could cross over. And it helps, again, to be in the cloud, to have clear understanding of documents and how they're stored. Uh, and you want to have the capabilities of policy and procedures. Here's what we do. Now you want to be careful, and this is complicated on quantitative and qualitative, but too many family offices aren't quantitative enough. You need to have measurables and metrics. You need to have some level of standard and policy and procedures. While not being 100% in that direction, the, the qualifiable, uh, the quantum qualifiable, you know what I mean, uh, that is more right-brained, that is more creative, that is more adapting on the fly, that everything is not so rigid. You want to have somewhat of a framework, like I said, but you want to have the capability for your staff to think for themselves and be creative. And these are all things that I mentioned earlier. Listen, there's no one size fits all. Generally, the trends that you'll see among wealthy families is they are going to be protective of what they built, of their wealth and of their legacy. Their brand and their image is often important to them. And again, a family office is part of something that is dedicated to them that helps create a buffer between them and the outside world and gives them the best in services, hopefully conflict-free, that they could get. And again, I built upon that strongly. So for many of these families, uh, mitigating taxes, managing their wealth, especially from a risk mitigation, a hedging, a protecting against black swans, and the transferring of their wealth and resources, how they want to have that happen to heirs, to loved ones, to philanthropy, whatever it may be. Uh, there are other family offices that are more service-centric, that especially in a larger family may take care of multiple or dozens of requests every week and maybe a little more concierge focused family offices that are more active in travel and security for the family, in bill pay, in more so aggregation and reporting of assets more so than managing it. So they're just so different. There's not one that's gonna be one size fits all. 
What did I say? Privacy, control, and customization. It's the customization part that is usually going to be the most valuable resources for families. And again, what did I say? You built up something special. Kudos, you won. And do you want something to go wrong? Sometimes as sadly as in one day and destroy what you built. Don't you feel that having a single family office, your own company, your own entity, unifying you and your family around not just your financial wealth, your legacy, your brand, and creating a buffer as needed between you and the world so you could do things that you love and are passionate about and have your family office be the professional team to manage the wealth and resources. At the end of the day, the buck stops with the family. If the family office isn't great, it's your fault. You didn't show leadership, cultural development. You might have been too frugal on comp. You might have cut corners. Stop it. If they're going to have a single family office, I would think you want to have it be great. Put the time, the money, and the effort into it. It'll be worth it. I'll give a little bit of context to the framework of who am I, in case you're seeing this for maybe the first time and don't have any context to that. I'm Angelo Robles. I'm the founder and CEO, as I noted, a family office association. We're headquartered in Greenwich, Connecticut, and we're a global membership organization dedicated to families of great success and their single family offices. We do a significant amount of content. I think at times I do as much content dedicated to the single family office community than anyone else in the world. We do a tremendous amount of physical events and programming during COVID. That's on hold. It'll one day come back. Uh, but in the meantime, we've been incredibly active Monday through Friday for our members hosting special, usually through Zoom, but some other options, online video meetings, interviewing amazing big name thought leaders and guests, world-class experts on family offices, on policy and procedures, on creativity, on processes to outcomes, on the new normal, on working more virtually in technology, uh, health and wellness. I could go on and on. We're rather diverse in terms of what we cover and how it's impactful to you as a wealthy family or an SFO executive. Uh, the virtual family office that I noted, the consultative services, the dream team that I've built to help family offices go from good to great, great to exceptional, exceptional to elite, the tabletop exercise and simulation services, a stress testing a family office, playing out what if scenarios, and really mitigating and hedging against risk. There's nothing wrong with that. We all have blind spots. We all have challenges. And in the insular world of the family office where sometimes group think and confirmation bias is too common, uh, having someone from the outside come in and look at some of the processes, policy, and procedures, uh, and enhancing productivity, and just having people to bounce ideas off of, and to, like I said earlier about, let's take the opposite approach, and let's try to poke holes in what may be a great idea that you have, but let's have a chance to flesh it out with an outside set of eyes. Uh, I'm also the host of Angelo Robles' Effective Family Office podcast on Apple, iHeart, Stitcher, and many other platforms. Uh, many of you know how to reach me at this stage. We're Family Office on YouTube, Family Office Association on Instagram. I'm Angelo Robles and my company, Family Office Association on LinkedIn. I do have a personal website. We're revamping it. It's AngeloRobles.com. And actually, as I'm mentioning it, we're revamping our FamilyOfficeAssociation.com website as well. Uh, and my email is probably generally the best to reach me, Angelo at Family Office Association. Well, hopefully this might have been a little better. It was probably too long. And yes, I do get a little passionate because I am obsessed with what I do and love what I do. But in helping those more broadly and even those that may have a foundation to understand what is a single family office I felt was important. I hope you enjoyed it. Everyone, have a great day. I'm Angelo Robles. Thank you.